Hey folks, so if you're just joining us, uh, welcome. And as you can see, we've got a poll going, so feel free to uh, click through that and answer the questions. And um, we're just gonna keep waiting for folks to trickle in and we'll get started in a few minutes here. All right, welcome to everyone just joining. Um, as you can see, we've got a poll up, so please respond to that. And uh, we're just gonna give it a few more minutes for more folks to join and we'll get started. All right, folks, welcome if you're just joining us. Uh, we're gonna give it a couple more minutes for folks to trickle in. Um, we've got a poll up and I think we're about to move to a new question. And uh, we'll get started. Here's our next question for the poll and we'll get started with uh, the presentation in just a minute. Just wanna make sure that um, we let everybody come in.
All right, welcome everybody. I think we have one more poll question that just went up. Um, so respond to that and then we will take a look at the poll results and then we'll get started. And uh, we're going to give just a few more seconds to respond to the poll, and uh, we're going to close it up. All right, polling is now closed. Mary Catherine um, is going to take a couple minutes and tabulate the results, and then um, we will get going here. So if everyone wants to take a look, you can see that um, your parents, about 58% of you went to school and about of your parents and about 60% took a car um, and then you will take a look at how you went to school as an aggregate and you'll see that shift has really started to go down right to more of a car from 6% to 22% and now let's take a look at how your children are getting to school. A lot of you don't have children, but for those of you who do, you can see how much the walk and bike share has dropped. And there are a lot of really interesting and complicated reasons for why people are not doing that. But you can see it went from your parents, go um, about 58% of your parents walking and biking to um, our children, 11%, which is a, interesting drop but it looks like buffing stayed approximately the same from 36 to 34 to 33 across the board um, so i think this is a good way to set the tone for this webinar to talk about how we can help change this dropping demographic of children using active transportation to get to school and with that i think i'm going to shift to jonathan Thanks, Mary Catherine. Um, some super interesting poll results there. I think expected, but always interesting to see. Um, so uh, welcome everyone. This is a webinar on how to ensure safe and healthy school travel during COVID-19. Um, this webinar is presented by us here at Local Motion, and it's made possible by, by VTRANS and the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission. So thanks very much to our partners. Uh, I'm Jonathan Weber, my pronouns are he, him, his, uh, and I'm the Livable Streets Program Manager uh, here at Local Motion. With us today, you just heard uh, Mary Catherine Graziano, who is the Senior Manager of Education and Safety Programs. Uh, Mary Catherine's gonna be monitoring questions throughout the webinar and also participating in our discussion at the end. Um, for those of you who don't know about Local Motion, our mission is to make biking and walking a way of life across Vermont. Uh, and that, of course, means working to ensure that kids are able to walk and bike to school. Um, today, we'll be joined by Mark Fenton, who I'll introduce in just a moment, as well as John Kaplan, who is VTrans's uh, Bicycle and Pedestrian Program Manager. So a bit of housekeeping before I introduce Mark. I'm going to do a little screen share here. So here's a little bit. If you're a little new to uh, go to webinar, <clears throat> this will just sort of acquaint you. So here's your control panel that you should be seeing. Um, we're going to keep everyone muted, but we are going to try and unmute folks at the end. So we ask that you submit questions in the chat box uh, throughout the presentation. Mary Catherine's going to monitor them. If we see anything really relevant, uh, we're going to interrupt Mark and ask that question. But for the most part, we're going to save them for the end. Uh, Mary Catherine is then going to unmute the map, the asker of each question. Um, and you'll probably have to unmute your line as well in order to talk. 
Um, we also recognize that a lot of folks probably have uh, you know, questionable internet connections. So um, if that looks to be an issue, we'll just remute you and Mary Catherine or I will voice the question. Um, so there's the chat box there. Um, some info on how to open and close your control panel. That's done with this arrow up here. So if you're not seeing this information, use this arrow to reopen it. Um, and today's presentation is being recorded and we will send that out within 48 hours along with some other resources. And there's the question box. Um, you can select to ask a question just to the staff or to everyone. Um, and with that, I will close this. So um, if you have any technical issues, um, you can talk to the moderator through that question box or you can contact Mary Catherine at marycatherine at localmotion.org. Um, this webinar is being recorded, as I said, and we'll share that out um, probably today, if not early tomorrow. Um, all right, so we're first gonna hear from Mark Fenn and then John Kaplan at VTrans and a couple of our staff here at Local Motion, and then we'll take those questions. Um, but again, please do post that questions as they come up. And um, let's get started. So our, our key presenter today is Mark Fenton. Mark is a National Public Health Planning and Transportation Consultant, an adjunct pro associate professor at Tufts University's Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy, and former host of the America's Walking series on PBS television. Mark is also the author of numerous books, including the best-selling Complete Guide to Walking for Health, Weight Loss, and Fitness, and he was a developer for the, of the University of North Carolina's Safe Routes to School Clearinghouse. Uh, um, sorry, I just lost my place here. He was a developer of the University of North Carolina's Safe Routes to School Clearinghouse and facilitator for the Walkable Community Workshop Series of the National Center for Bicycling and Walking. He now provides technical training and community planning as an independent consultant. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand this over to Mark. Hi, Jonathan, thanks so much. Uh, and thanks you guys for having me. Again, my name is Mark Fenton. My pronouns are he, him, and his. And I am uh, really honored to be joining Local Motion, an organization I've known about for quite some time and been lucky enough to work with over the years as a, uh, a partner in, in some of my work in Vermont and, and my friend and colleague, John Kaplan, who um, I've also had the good fortune of working with a lot over the years. I think you're gonna give me screen share ability, Jonathan, here, um, uh, uh, presenter ability. I think you have to give that to me one more time. Um, oh, let's see. I, uh, I'm gonna show some slides. Uh, I don't know if you, there it is. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy to be, uh, I've, I've had the good fortune of working with Vermont on and off over the years enough that you're going to see some Vermont area photos, but I've also chosen to share examples from other communities I've worked with around the country, though that will feel re relevant. They're, they're, for example, communities that have large rural areas that have um, mountainous terrain, uh, that have snow. You know, the, Some of the challenges that you face when we talk about doing things like encouraging kids to walk and bike to school, as these youngsters were doing in St. Albans when I was visiting there a few years ago. Um, I like to open with sort of the executive summary. So if you decide to take a nap or check your email for the rest of the talk, here are the four or five big points I'm gonna make. We know there are great physical activity benefit, uh, benefits to being physically active and to active transportation. Uh, they are even more so during the pandemic. We know that people who are physically active and healthy will withstand not just uh, chronic diseases, but also infectious diseases more, more successfully. There is a lot of concern that school-induced traffic may be notably heavier than usual if parents are concerned about putting children on buses. So um, we may see not just the normal traffic loads, but even worse traffic loads at schools at arrival and dismissal time. Walking and cycling, obviously, you know, more kids walking and cycling could create some relief to that. It could help improve air quality, less, less of that um, vehicle emissions at schools and the health benefits I just alluded to. So there are many, many benefits of getting more, more, more youth walking and bicycling. And we know that safe routes to school approaches can work. This idea of a, of a unified program that really try to encourage more walking and bicycling can shift behavior, but it can't just be an encouragement program. It could be just saying to people, you should walk and bike, it's good for you and it's good for the environment. That's not enough. You have to, we have to create the infrastructure and the policy supports if you really wanna shift behavior. Um, otherwise, the kind of traffic pictured in these images will only potentially be worse this year. 
So the flow is, I'd like to talk a little about that health need and, and the, the pandemic, amplify those points by talking a little about the, the health need and, and in particular how the pandemics may be affect, affecting that. Uh, the five E's of Safe Routes to School, that's kind of at the National Center for Safe Routes to School and the National, uh, when we developed a curriculum around this, we talked about five E's, they have evolved and I wanna share that evolution with you. Share some resources, you'll get that from me, you'll also get that from John and from the local motion team and we hope to conclude with a couple of um, uh, uh, time, some time for discussion. Here are just images from some of the places I've been lucky enough to visit. And, you know, I understand the conditions. Often when we're talking about rural communities with, you know, on rural roads uh, that may not even have sidewalks, uh, certainly, you know, not no designated bicycle lanes. Uh, these are the kind of conditions we might be asking parents to let their kids and those children to actually walk or bicycle in. So we have to be aware of, of the challenges that are faced. Um, Given that, I still think that there are ways to to fight this reality. So it's funny, we did the little poll and it sort of aligned with the evidence that we see nationally. This is research that shows um, uh, uh, the dramatic reductions in the percentage of kids walking and cycling to school over roughly a three decade period from about 1970 to 2000, from over 40% to less than 15. And that was, you know, notice that the number of kids riding the bus about the same, which seemed to be the case with the data we just looked at, you know, the little anecdotal data that we just looked at. Um, and what you see is these dramatic increases in the number of kids uh, arriving at school by car. I don't think it's coincidence that these three decades coincide with a period over which childhood obesity rates tripled. Um, it, 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 as children reduced physical activity, and of course there were changes in nutritional habits over that time period as well, admittedly, um, but what we see is these dramatic changes in, in health outcomes for youth. Now, there are a lot of people who say, but Mark, you know, that's the same 30 or 40 years over, over which uh, there were dramatic changes in the size of schools. For example, elementary schools got much larger, you know, went from 150 to 600 kids on average, meaning they were covering larger distances so kids were coming from greater distance there are more single parent households there are more households where both parents work there are a lot of reasons that drove that shift i have no doubt about that um but i would also say that when we talk to parents often what you hear the, the reason they talk about is oh it's not safe kids are being plucked off the street the special issue of time magazine and many others have looked at that question and found no evidence that that's the case so um the notion that um um, that it's a much more dangerous world from that perspective is probably not accurate. And in fact, if you want to talk about what statistically has changed over that 30 years, the probably the, the much more accurate picture is that of, of uh, portrayed by the, this other Time Magazine issue in which uh, they point out the fact that we now estimate, well, a disease that we once called adult onset diabetes, adult onset diabetes, we now call type two diabetes. And, uh, and that's because we now see it in nine and 10 year olds. So it's not just adults that get this type of diabetes. And it's further estimated by the Centers for Disease Control that one in three children born today will have type two diabetes at some point in their lifetimes. So this is a dramatic change. It's, uh, um, it's, it's really monstrous from a public health standpoint, because if you want to destroy a healthcare system, what you would do is give one third of your population type two diabetes at some point in their time, in their lifetime. Um, and that's the, the, what we're tracking toward. Um, and in fact, uh, I'll put this on scale with the pandemic that we're facing right now, because this is just a, a further daunting complication to sort of health outcomes for all of us, but especially our kids. Um, on the left of the column here, I've got a, a range of, of root causes of death, and they are not aligned with the actual numbers. On the right are estimates of, of rough figures, either from recent years or, or uh, averages of several years, typical premature deaths in the United States to these seven, but they are not aligned right now. So as you look at them, see if you could match them up. So this is just a little mental exercise. I'm not gonna make you actually do it. We won't make this a poll question or anything, but think about, you know, sort of well, about how many Americans die in motor vehicle collisions? How many die to the diseases of tobacco use, to opi opioid overdose? Uh, how many die in pedestrians? How many pedestrians are killed every year in the United States? How much, uh, many people would refer to the obesity epidemic. I would much prefer, and I think clinically more accurately, we would refer, refer to the epidemics of physical inactivity and poor nutrition. Um, how about seasonal flu? How about COVID? What are we estimating there? Now, some of these I think you'll know and others you may be surprised because as you look at them, we know that the pedestrian deaths are on the order of five to 6,000 a year over recent years. They've fluctuated. We've sometimes gotten that number lower. Right now, it's actually been on a rising trend the last few years. Seasonal flu will kill anywhere from 30 to 50,000 every year. Motor vehicle collisions is a similar order of magnitude. Opioid deaths on the order of 60 to 70,000 a year over recent years. 
COVID, we don't even know, but the, tragically, this number continues to rise, and there are now estimates coming out of University of Washington and others that project, particularly with a, 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 re, a spiking again in November, which is quite possible, those deaths could reach 300,000. But here's the biggie for me. Every year, so, so this is striking, right? These COVID deaths that are, could approach 300,000, and, and it is literally, we've stalled our economy, we've dramatically changed sort of all sorts of things about how we live every day. Yet every year we accept something like 400,000 deaths to inactivity and poor nutrition in the form of cardiovascular disease, uh, type 2 diabetes and its complications, hypertension, uh, stroke, right? The whole range of, of, of afflictions associated with inactive lifestyle and poor nutrition. And of course, tobacco deaths at approaching 500,000 a year. So those last two approach a million deaths a year that we just accept as the, the, the cost of how we live in American lifestyles. Um, all of that I'm saying to put in context, we know that if we could help kids be more physically active, we could help reduce the risk for one of the top causes of premature death in this country. And furthermore, what has become very clear during the epidemic is that, that during the pandemic is that people with comorbidities such as high blood pressure, uh, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular risk factors are at much greater risk, lung diseases, they are much greater risk to adverse outcomes and death due to COVID-19. So to, to, to put as fine a point on this as I can, one of the most protective things beyond all of the sanitation measures, wearing of masks, hand washing, safe social distancing, beyond all of that, one of the best things you can do to protect yourself from COVID-19 is to be physically active and healthy and have cardiorespiratory fitness so that you're ready to resist it. Now this, this, I can't say how important this is because it means it's one of the protective measures for both chronic disease and infectious disease would be to have more people being more physically active every day. The reason I say that is because we estimate as few as 30% of youth or less and as few as 5 or 10% of adults actually meet the guidelines, the recommended daily physical activity guidelines, which is about 30 minutes of physical activity a day. What's striking about that is a 15 minute walk to and from school would fulfill an adult's obligation. We actually recommend that youth get more like an hour of physical activity a day. Um, but again, maybe 30% uh, or 40% of youth meet that. So there's a great need here to increase physical activity from a public health standpoint that is compelled by both long-term chronic disease risk, but also here during the ep a a pandemic. So a fair question to ask would be, okay, smarty pants, fast talking guy, can we build communities where people are more likely to get their 30 or 60 minutes of physical activity a day? And the answer is yes, actually we can. Um, that that the, uh, there are, there's very good body of research out there that suggests basically four things characterize communities where people tend to walk and bicycle more. Not necessarily just for recreation and leisure too, for transportation. That would be the mix of land uses. So having nearby destinations like neighborhood schools, for example, but also neighborhood shopping, nearby destinations. The network of facilities, the sidewalk, the bicycle facilities that connect those destinations destinations. The details of site design would be rewarding for the pedestrian and the bicyclist. So in other words, we would reward you for showing up on foot. There'd be a bike rack, there'd be a water fountain, there's public seating, uh, the buildings are up at the street, not set back behind a giant parking lot. And it'd be safe and accessible for all users, people of all abilities and disabilities, all ages, all incomes, all races and backgrounds. So if that, if, if you were to say, Mark, build a world, where more people got the daily physical activity through routine physical activity, I'd say these would be the four things that would characterize what I want to do. And planners and, and increasingly, you know, public health agencies are connecting on these conversations and we're trying to do more of this all around the country. I give that as background because when we start to think about encouraging walking and bicycling to school, yet there's a case to be made that you can't, we're not, the school's built, so I'm not going to move it. I mean, we would love better decisions about school siting. I would love to retain more neighborhood schools, and I would love us to reconsider whether we put schools on the edge of town. And indeed, in the in the resource resources that you're going to get after this webinar, you'll see two great documents on school siting policies. And when schools are doing assessments or communities are doing assessments, should we close the neighborhood school and build the new one on the edge of town or refurbish the, um, the school in Town, we should be adding health considerations to that analysis, right? And long-term transportation costs, not just um, and whether there's more field space at the new location. Having said that, um, if we can't move the schools where they are, do Safe Routes to Schools programs, can we still encourage more walking and bicycling with what we have? And the answer is yes. There's good evidence. This is from an organization called Active Living Research out of UC San Diego. And this infographic kind of summarizes a number of studies which are cited at the bottom. And again, on the resource list, you can find how to get this material. Anything I'm showing, in fact, in my talk, just so you know, those resources and links are in the, 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 the resource list we'll send out at the end of the webinar. 
um, we know they can work. They can actually shift the number of kids and also make it safer because those go hand in hand. If you're really going to convince parents to let their children walk and bike to school, then needless to say, we want to be making it safer. One of the benefits, by the way, is that meaningful percentage of the kids are getting more daily physical activity as a result of that. Furthermore, another one of the infographics that ALR has put together, Active Living Research, is this that shows kids who are physically active tend to learn better. There are other studies that also show they tend to have fewer disciplinary referrals from the classroom. In other words, if they've been physically active in the morning by walking and bicycling, at least some of the route to school, um, they may be more ready to learn. They may have burnt off energy. There are a lot of ways that that may be beneficial. It may have to do even with oxygen flow to the brain through physical activity, but active kids seem to learn better and have fewer um, uh, a disciplinary rural referrals, which is really beneficial. So if I'm an educator, I care about that, right? I, want, I would love to have kids showing up in the classroom ready to learn. So you should say, okay, so you've just told me that Safe Routes to School programs work. What do they entail? Generally, the, the approach over the many years that we've been doing this for, you know, over uh, two decades now, we talked about the five E's. And historically, those five E's were enforcement, evaluation, engineering, education, and encouragement. You'll notice that I've taken enforcement off and the National Safe Routes Partnership and other national organizations are encouraging that we make the first E engagement or equity and talk about engaging the community and talking about what would be an equitable way to approach this. One of the reasons, and I, I must give great credit to the Black Lives Matter movement for really raising our attention around this is that there are communities, there are neighborhoods, there are districts where the notion of enforcement in the form of a law enforcement may not be a comfortable approach. In other words, that may not be the most welcome way to, for example, slow traffic near schools or make it safer for kids to walk and bike. Um, so that the idea here is that community engagement with the residents, with the parents, with the students, with the faculty and administrators uh, uh, about what's best for that community and what's going to work for them is really, really important right up front. Uh, a good example would be this great program that the pictures are from, from Blue Island, Illinois, where they had, when I was visiting them now, this is some years ago, a great program targeting largely low-income youth with a three-pronged program that include classroom uh, safety training, on-bike skills training, and bicycle construction and maintenance. And if students stayed through the whole program and completed it successfully, they walked around away with a bike and a properly fitting helmet and the skills to both use and maintain that bicycle. Um, and again, they targeted the very kids who were least likely to have access to a bicycle in their community. So the e-equity was forefront in, in that program. Um, so having said that, I will say that engagement, equitable community engagement, and uh, is one of the very first things we want to do. And I think one of the best ways to do that, and one that local motion helps us, uh, helps communities do, and, and I've had the great good fortune of doing in a number of communities around uh, Vermont, is walk audits. The idea of getting out and doing a facilitated walk. Now, it's not just doing the walk together. There are really three parts. There's kind of the gathering people and having a discussion about the background and talking about what are our goals. We want to make it safer for kids to walk and bike. We want to look at the reality of what's out there. What would we have to do to make it safer. Uh, then we go do that walk, that facilitated walk, look at the challenging conditions like the picture in the top left here in St. Albans where those kids, by the way, coming down the trail from the left, which is sort of a neighborhood cut through trail, um, through a hole in a fence, no less, were on their way to, uh, but they were going to have to cross that road, which didn't even have marked crosswalks at the time. Um, so, so it gives you a sense of sort of the challenges that, that youth often uh, tr face and which adults are sometimes insensitive to if they haven't gone out and actually walked the route. So one of the reasons I love walk audits is to have a principal and a director of public works and a planner and a, an elected official walking right next to, uh, on the very route that the kids would be walking within the, the walk zone and seeing, wow, they're up against this. Um, and looking at the traffic that they face because often it is the school induced traffic that is one of the reasons parents don't let kids walk. Let me say this again. Frequently when I've worked in communities and we ask parents, why wouldn't you let your child walk to school? There's a sidewalk the whole way. They know it's not that far. It's only you know three quarters of a mile. They can do that in 15 minutes. The answer is the traffic in and around the school, getting in and out of the driveways and so on is so chaotic. I feel like it's not safe enough. So I drive them. Thereby, of course, contributing to the very traffic that we're talking about. I'm not making light of this. I'm suggesting that we should go out and see that. And that's one of the things you can explore in a walk audit. And then, then we have to start thinking about how do we, what do we do about that? I, the next e evaluation really goes hand in hand with that opening engagement. Do some evaluation. Ask parents where, where and students, where are you coming from? What's your start and your ending location? Uh, what mode do you use? Why? What would it be needed? What would you need to shift? Because sometimes it's the answer would be, well, that sidewalk never gets cleared of snow in the winter. It could be um, that there's no crosswalk painted at the intersection or pedestrian signal. Um, we use show of survey, hand surveys in the classroom, by the way. We don't just ask kids, how do you normally get to school? We actually say, how did you get to school this morning? How did you get home last night? Because we find that 
data is more reliable. If you say, how do you normally get to school? If they occasionally ride the bus or if they think they're supposed to be a bus rider, they may answer bus, when in fact they're driven three days, driven to school by car three out of five days. But if you ask, how did you get to school today? How did you get home last night? You're gonna get much more accurate data on what the mode split is. Um, one of the interesting exercises that we're having communities sometimes do is actually map where kids could walk and bike from and where clusters are. Here's an unusually shaped school district in Missouri where we worked. It's relevant because the schools over here, if you can see the little black dot in the red school, and yet they have this big flag of land that is part of their district during due to population growth. Now what's interesting, um, this is a schematic of sort of how you might do a, a, a clustering of where kids are coming from by their mode. So you notice some number of kids here are walking and bicycling to school, but as you get further away, they're given bus service. And many of those are driven. And when you ask parents, they say, well, geez, the, the bus comes through the neighborhood here, it takes forever. It's a, the ride to school is 45 minutes. I can drive them in 20. Um, so one of the anal analyses that came out of this workshop was that they, they said, what would it take to create collected bus stops, one or two stops only in this neighborhood, rather than the bus stopping at every, every driveway, uh, and then maybe even make a couple of uh, uh, bus stop shelters, because this was uh, in, in Rhode Island, so cold weather environment, they get snow in the winter, it's, it's wintry, not, maybe not as wintry as Vermont, but wintry. Uh, and, uh, and that was one of the solutions was to, I'm sorry, this wasn't Rhode Island, this was Missouri, but we did the same exercise in Rhode Island and that's where the bus stop shelter is from. Uh, Rhode Island where they did that exercise and they realized a neighborhood stop could allow kids to get a little walk at the beginning of their trip to school, still ride the bus, and now the length of the bus ride goes down, right? It's not a 45 minute ride, now it's down to 25 because we're not stopping in every driveway, we're not going in every cul-de-sac. Um, my point is, these are the kinds of things that can come out of the evaluation process. Where are kids? By what mode are they coming? What could we do to um, make it more viable for them to walk, even as part of the trip, if not the full trip? Education is the, the 30, and uh, needless to say, things like student skills and awareness, pedestrian skills, bicycle skills, those are all pretty obvious. Local motion does a lot of work in that area and would be a great partner for you. I highly recommend that. Um, I wanna point out that, oh, and many schools build it into the curriculum. So successful schools will make their walk and bike to school program part of their curriculum. They're counting steps in math class. They're talking about health benefits in biology class. They're doing ma mapping in geography classes. Um, I'm gonna say that the hard target here is the second bullet, parents and drivers who are notoriously hard to educate and very recalcitrant in my experience. I don't want to be unkind, but man, so the school here, the pictured with the no entry, staff parking only, cars would continually pull in and out of here to pick up. Oh, I'm just picking up Jimmy. Oh, no, I, I, I'm sorry. I'm, it's okay. Parents will say this. It's okay. I'm running late. I have to get Timmy. Uh, no, it's not okay that you're going to run somebody over because this is where the bicyclists and the pedestrians come out. So the bottom line is we have frequently found we have to literally have kids out there put cones in the road. You know, parent, a sign is not enough. Even when in this per chance there happened to be a policeman sitting there, that wasn't enough. So they have to cone off the entryway in this school in Wisconsin. This safety patrol's duty every day was to, at, at a point when there was a break, actually put the cones across the driveway where cars were not allowed. Parent education has to be very blunt sometimes. <laughs> Um, the encouragement is the, perhaps the most fun of it. Uh, so you've probably heard of the idea of a walking school bus, the idea of a designated route to school that an adult will walk every day, picking children up along the way, bicycle trains. You can set routes, you can set schedules. This bike route, by bicycle train had a very specific schedule. I rode with them uh, when they were doing their walks in Columbia, Missouri, and, or their bike rides. Um, and you know we knew we were gonna be at this intersection at 7.15. And, and in fact, if they were early, they'd wait till because they knew kids might be coming from the neighborhood to join the group at 7.15 at that intersection. Um, setting up corner captains. Those are adults who, who are not, don't have a duty to even cross kids at the drive. They're just gonna be adult eyes with a cell phone on the street where the kids come by just to keep an eye on things and, and make sure everybody's okay. Um, one of the, the little encouragement policies that I love is the idea of a, a safety delay. At dismissal time, increasing numbers of schools, and I think Local Motion gives in a couple of examples of these, um, they are, are doing things like releasing the pedestrians and bicyclists first to get them clear of all the conflict points in and near the school grounds, the intersections where cars come in and out and so on. Get them clear, then start moving the car line, the pickup line at school at dismissal. The nice thing there is that you're creating a strong incentive, and that incentive is for, um, for kids to want to walk and bike, right? Because they don't want to sit inside for the extra four or five minutes while their friends are already taking off. They say, let me let me walk with the walking school bus. Let me ride with the bicycle train. Um, any number of schools, by the way, do things. Uh, don't tell me that Safe Routes to School can't work in winter environments. Uh, schools have done things like polar bear clubs where they reward them. This this punch card was a card that, that you got punched every day you walk and bike to school. And then when you'd finished it, you got a prize like colored shoelaces or zipper poles or things like that. Um, um, it's an elementary school, fun little prizes like that, nothing. But 
if you walked on particularly snowy or rainy days, uh, the, the principal would declare a double punch day and you'd get two punches or even three punches if the weather was really adverse. And kids prided themselves on being members of the polar bear club and walking straight through winter and not missing a day and so on. Um, I will say about encouragement in this five minute safety delay, it can be very effective if paired with what we call a satellite drop off location. So here's a map from a, a school where they created satellite pick up and drop offs about a quarter mile from the school. This was at their town assessor's office and this was at a church that had a big and underutilized parking lot. This is the parking lot down below here. Uh, here's the school and it, they called it the RAP program, remote alternative parking. And the idea was, you know, park here and let your child walk, maybe wait for a couple of other kids, let them walk together or you could walk them. Uh, we had adult if the, um, adult volunteers that would be there to, to kind of greet the kids at the beginning of the school year to create the, the kind of the norm around this. Interestingly enough, as you uh, returning from the pandemic, if you're going to be doing temperature checks or health checks uh, for kids and, and many uh, states around the country that's being considered, and I understand it is in Vermont, um, that could happen here. You could do a, a temperature check right here and thus maybe ease some of the congestion that's gonna happen at the school at arrival time, particularly in the morning. Um, but you can imagine having remote drop off and pick up happening you know, a quarter mile or a third of the mile from the school at a parking lot eases motor vehicle congestion greatly. Um, in, in, when we were introducing this, we actually put out helium balloons along the route to sort of increase awareness and have parents and, and teachers more comfortable with that, parents and the students more comfortable with the notion of that route. Um, if this route from this church went up this sidewalk, so we had the helium balloons there, and then they came to this crosswalk, so it was made a celebration. Um, I'm proud to say uh, this actually was created by my wife at, at, at our school district, and to this day, we can go see the church parking lot that's a remote drop-off location, and I still see dozens of cars dropping off and picking up there because the relationship was built between the school and the church. Uh, the, these, some of these procedures were set up, and to this day, it's used as a remote drop-off pickup location, meaning those kids are getting at least some walk and the traffic congestion at the school is much better. This is a, a, an informal walking school bus. I do want to make clear that a walking school bus doesn't have to be formal and structured. It can have a structure and a schedule and you can have parents go through training and do criminal background checks and have, have lots of structure if you want. They also, we have seen them happen very informally. This is a group of kids that walk together where older siblings are kind of watching out for and walking with a group of younger siblings. It just sort of happened casually, uh, informally that, you know, one of the older ones is at the front, one of the older ones at the back. Uh, they press the button, they make sure the little ones wait for the light to change. Um, so a walking, that's, but to me, that's a version of a walking school bus. It just happens to be a different version. Um, and then the last E is the engineering, the infrastructure. Clearly, you can say, Mark, this is all well and good. I don't, there's not, there's not a single place my kids can walk safely to our school. And, and I understand there may, you may, may be rural school, rural locations. Certainly lots of schools are on the, the state highways that are, you know, heavily traveled, high-speed roadways. I get that. Um, although I would suggest the act of getting a group together, going out on a walk audit and looking for routes, the number of times we've found um, utility corridors that lend themselves to becoming informal trails from neighborhoods to schools, uh, where we find when we walk the road that there's a very wide shoulder there and that if we could designate that as an actual pedestrian way or even give it some protection, it might be a viable place for pedestrians to walk or bike. Having said that, what I'm talking about is the engineering, the physical infrastructure, identifying the routes and considering low cost and demonstration treatments. Now, the picture on the lower left here is a beautiful set of retrofit curb extensions. You'll notice, by the way, they are not built off of the curb. They didn't have to change the drainage. So if there are engineers and planners among the group, you can realize how much less expensive doing a curb extension like this is than it having to actually bring the entire curb out and then change all where the drainage structures are and things like that, which is what they avoided by doing it this way in this particular case. However, very low cost measures such as simply marking routes. So this stencil is parents that are marking for walk to school day, but hoping to help encourage the regular use of a route. This bike rack, interestingly enough, when we did the walk audit at this school, we literally were standing there and somebody pointed out, well, geez, even if we can get people to bike to school, there's nowhere to park them. And the police chief happens to be with us on the walk. He goes, you know, we've got two bike racks in the basement. I know they're the old style, what we call wheel benders, but they're better than nothing. And they're sitting in the basement of the police department. We'd be happy to bring them down here. And, and the, the PE teacher who was on the walk audit with us says, he got a pickup. I've got my pickup truck. Let's run up there again. Literally two days later, the bike racks were there. Are they perfect? No. Are they way better than having no bike racks? Yes. Did kids start using them immediately? Um, so I, I'd like to give that as an example. Not everything has to cost a lot. And we should not 
uh, let, never let the, the the perfect be the enemy of the good here. Let's let's do what we can do in the short term, marking a route, putting in the bike racks, knowing that over the long term we'd like to do, make the bigger infrastructure changes. A great example of this is from Billings, Montana, where they identified this as a crossing location. It was a mid-block crossing, and they said we've got a lot of students trying to get from a neighborhood on the right, school on the left. Um, a, a curb extension here to narrow the corridor, make pedestrians more visible, slow traffic, increase the visibility of the crosswalk would be great. Public Works said, you know, to do the one with concrete and dig up the asphalt and everything would cost us literally hundreds of thousands, but we could do a low cost you know, one with rubber curb extension, uh, curbing material here, paint, signs, and just see if anybody's actually gonna use it. They did that in about 2008. Several years later, this road, came up, Holly Road it is, came up for repaving. In other words, it was going to be part of a reconstruction project. And when they did it, they added the full-blown curb extensions here. So now you see the concrete with the ADA compliant curb ramp. The, the, they moved the uh, uh, they moved the drainage structures, uh, high visibility crosswalk signage. Uh, the beauty of this, by the way, is they did a full complete streets overdue here. They included bicycle lanes and everything as part of this work. It was much easier for them to do this. By the way, the cost much lower because it was part of a major repaving project anyway. So it doesn't cost nearly as much. The marginal cost quite low. And much easier to justify the cost having done the very low cost installation before, proven the viability, show that it was demand, pedestrians were going to use it. Um, Having said that, there are, uh, the, the, you know, sort of even for state highways, large roads, there are techniques to get pedestrians across. I'm not going to suggest you're going to go out and do these tomorrow, um, uh, but John can talk to you about the funding programs and the time scale for these more substantive type treatments if you need them. If you're on a state highway, if you've got larger, you know, multi-lane roads, things like that. A good example is this. This is called a HAWK, a high activation walk signal, I think is what the acronym is. Um, um, but uh, use this is out in Phoenix, Arizona, by the way, notorious problems with speed and pedestrian collisions out there. And they have found these signals to be very beneficial. I'm not saying they're the solution in many, many cases, but compare this to, you know, often we get to state highways and people are, we need an overpass, the kids need a bridge, and we know those costs can literally cost a million bucks. These are more like tens and hundreds of thousands versus a million dollars, and much more likely to get used. Many people will not go out of their way to go over an overpass. So my little takeaway lesson there is don't ask for a bridge. Look at what the what kind of at-grade treatment is viable, and, and John can talk a little about, you know, sort of working with the state on that. Um, one last thing I want to talk about, uh, the creating bicycle routes. Um, we have long theorized that there's sort of a range of people's willingness to bike. If you look at the population of the U.S. from those who are not going to, to those who are already strong and confident cyclists to, we've always assumed there's a large number in the middle that are interested in bicycling, but are concerned about doing it if it's not safe and inviting. And in fact, the data bears that out. There's good evidence that this could be as much as 60% of the population. And if we think of youth, it's probably larger. If you think about parents, they're, they're interested in having their kids ride, but boy, they're not gonna just stick them out on a road with no protection. So if you think about the range of bicycle facilities from doing nothing, just asking somebody to ride on the road like a like a vehicle to providing a share row or shared use arrow or a bicycle lane or a bicycle lane with a little bit of buffering. So here the, the, it's an extra wide stripe here that gives you some separation to an actual protected bike lane. So in this case, there are little vertical delineators here and in fact, parked cars between the bike lane and the street to off-road facilities. This is part of the, the, the Lamoille uh, Valley River Trail Rail Trail. So as you go from the top left picture here to the bottom left, you go from the least protection to the most, right? And I'm gonna to suggest to you that if we're really serious about getting kids cycling to school, you gotta be looking at the kinds of treatments on the bottom here. You've gotta give some amount of protection and or separation, depending on the traffic volume and speed and so on. I mean, there may be local neighborhood streets, very little traffic, very slow speeds where a painted bike lane or even a shared use arrow would be enough. But I think there are a lot of parents would tell you, give me a, a designated space for, for my child to ride that is out of traffic. Um, I think we need to think about that. Uh, and that then leads me to some design guidance. So I'm going to conclude here with some some resources and 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 uh, referent materials that I think you can you would find beneficial in your work. Uh, these are three from the National Association of City Transportation Officials. They're the Urban Street Design Guide. They have an Urban Bikeway Design Guide. This is a Small Town and Multimodal Network Guide from the Federal Highway Administration. Really high quality. I, any planners, engineers, public works folks on this call, if you don't have a copy of, that, of this on your desk, go to the website. It's in the resource list that we're going to give you. Download it. It's free. Print it out. Bind it. 
and keep it. It is a great reference piece, as is their guidebook for developing pedestrian and bicycle performance measures. Also, and these are both from FHWA, uh, I, I just highly recommend them as reference materials. Um, I'll give you an example. Here are two examples from the Small Town Rural Multimodal Guide. Um, they talk about ped pedestrian lanes. These are really relevant for small and rural communities, not a lot of resources, low volume streets potentially. So this is just a pedestrian lane that they, they applied this version, the pedestrian lane, in Bonners Ferry, Idaho. So Bonners Ferry, Northern Idaho, foothills of the mountains, wintry town, wintry, rural. I mean, it's it could be, it's Western Vermont, basically. It's a Western version of Vermont. And at this school, they know on Friday nights when the home football games are here, the stadium is just off to the right, the school is here, and their, their football field is right there. People park higher. And so you could have said, well, no, it's a parking lane. We can't make that a pedestrian lane. Or you could say, hmm, for the other hundreds of hours of a week, other than the five hours of the Friday night football games, this is an empty lane that we could make a pedestrian lane. And to the credit of the public works and highway supervisor, they said that. They said, fine, we're going to acknowledge that people are going to park here on Friday nights, but the rest of the time, this is a great walking path that gets you to one of the access points to the school grounds on a road that we can't, we don't have the money to build a sidewalk tomorrow. Would the perfect solution be a sidewalk over here? Of course it would. But until we do that, let's do this. Similarly, an advisory shoulder. This is a shoulder that you paint. It's advisory. It's got a dashed line. It says, normally bicyclists or pedestrians will be in the shoulder and cars will drive in the middle. On a low volume street, on the occasion when traffic has to pass one another, they go into the shoulder. Um, here's an example from Hanover, New Hampshire, a nearby neighbor, similar climate, similar terrain. Um, so my point is, lots of those kinds of tools, very low cost treatments that could be used to improve walk and bike routes uh, that I think are relevant to Vermont. One other relevant resource, NACTO has specifically, that's again, the National Association of City Transportation Officials, a specific guide to streets for pandemic response and recovery. And examples they give are for to create temporary bicycle lanes, temporary uh, uh, um, sort of uh, um, dining spaces, all sorts of things like this. Um, that temporary bike lane idea though, by the way, we did this years ago in Whitefish, Montana. This is several years ago. We did a walk audit. We got the interdisciplinary group together. We did the walk audit. We identified a wide street here where uh, a, a bicycle lane, a protected bike lane we created a temporary one or they i should give them credit they created a temporary bike lane here and there were many parents who said nobody's gonna let their kids ride to school anyway it's just they're too nervous they're not gonna do it go ahead and create your bike lane we'll see and what they did was fill the schoolyard with bikes once a protected facility was created a lot of parents were comfortable and once there were other kids out riding they actually didn't end up creating a permanent bike lane on this street they found a street over also wide less traffic nobody needed to use the parking lane that's the one that they put the bicycle lane on um, I can't overstate the value of doing these temporary types of treatments. And in fact, one more resource that you'll see on the resource list is from the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. That's the Regional Transportation Commission for the Bay Area out in California, but very innovative and forward thinking. They've got a bunch of materials, including, for example, their intervention objects, both temporary treatments and permanent treatment materials that you can use, like those stanchions you saw that just created that temporary bike lane. Um, but other examples here, uh, this is a ex curb extension that's been painted, created with paint and flexible vertical delineators. Here's an actual two-way bike lane pathway that was created by using paint and vertical delineators to separate from the from the travel lane. I think this is a viable solution for any number of roads in Vermont that has, if they have a substantial shoulder, delineating it like this could make it a viable pedestrian and bikeway. Um, in Wolcott, Vermont, very small town up in the Moyle Valley area, um, uh, they identified this parking lot as a barrier. They said people will park down here by these stores and then get in their car and drive up here to go to the post office and town hall because this wide open gravel area, which is sort of the municipal parking, it's kind of a free fire zone. Cars can come in and out and everywhere. And I said, can you, why don't you try some temporary low cost materials and just see if you could create a walkway across the front, define an entry and an exit way, uh, and um, just see if it makes it any better. We did that in April. That was an April walk audit. In July of that year, they sent me these pictures that were in the local newspaper too, of the planters, which by the way, got adopted as sort of a community garden, as I understand it. People were planting vegetables and herbs and things. And these curb stops, which also, by the way, made the parking area more efficient and also created, defined a walkway. This is a really inexpensive treatment. Uh, and I know there's all over Vermont, there are gas stations and stores and places that have wide open entry areas that are dangerous to walk across the front of it. Simply defining where the entrance and the exit is and creating a walkway could make them safer. Here's a thing called a wave delineator. It's just a little delineator that delineates the, the, the trail here. This is part of the rail trail from an actual driveway here. 
Um, some of these other materials from the Metropolitan Training Commission talk about uh, changing signal timing, uh, taking away the need for a pedestrian to hit a button at a pedestrian crossing, if there is a pedestrian signal, just having it always include the pedestrian face, and other design approaches. So here, the idea of creating a median island at very low cost with uh, delineators and paint. And you say, well, what would that look like? Well, when we did a walk audit at Ellis Elementary School in Boston, we tried it with cones during the walk audit to say, would this be a good spot for a little pedestrian island? And when they said, yes, Public Works said, okay, we can't build it out of asphalt and concrete right now. That costs a lot digging up the street. But we can, with some paint, vertical delineators, pedestrian signs, we could create a, a essentially the equivalent of a pedestrian island, a protected crossing here. Um, I think that we could do lots of this kind of work at very low cost. Uh, and I will suggest that there's a great webinar if you want more of this, if you're a geek for this stuff, Tool Design, which is the name of a company, T-O-O-L-E, uh, did a great webinar on this a few months ago, and they've updated this website with more materials and so on. So if you're thinking about this, I would urge you to think about all three of the P's or all five of the E's, but think about the programmatic stuff you'll do, getting people out for the walk audit. Think about uh, the policy you might adopt, like a complete streets policy. We're going to think about this everywhere, all of our streets, and the actual physical projects. These are students in Maui, Hawaii, who identified this intersection. Cars made the turn too fast. They said curb extensions would narrow it down, shorten the crossing distance, slow the turning vehicles, make it much safer. The kids volunteered to paint it, so they did the paint. Uh, Public Works put in the vertical delineators, and it was the combination of all three of the P's that made it work. In Westlaco, Texas, these students were concerned they couldn't cross this four-lane road. Nobody ever yielded for them, and this is the high school, and right across the street on this corner, it, closest to us is uh, South Texas College, where a lot of the kids went for after-school programs and vocational training and AP classes. They said, we want to paint the crosswalk with the panther paws, because we're the panthers. We're the purple panthers, and we want purple panther paws. And the public works director could have said, well, that's not part of the manual on uniform traffic control devices, so we can't do it. Or he could say, you know what? Those crosswalks are faded. I'm going to send my crew out. We're going to repaint them. And then we're going to mix the paint for you. We're going to even build the stencils, and we're going to go a step further, and we're going to teach you how to use it, and you guys are going to paint it. The beauty of this story is that when I told everybody at the end of the day, I said, come on, everybody line up. I want to take your pictures. This is the coolest thing. And I thought the kids would all run over. Public works folks all run over. The police officers who'd help control traffic. Everybody wanted to be a part of it. And to me, that was the success. It's not the painted crosswalk. It's the relationship that was built between the school, public works, city council, the, the law enforcement. Uh, they all saw this as their need. And those kids now continue to be involved in improving the well-being uh, and the safety for walking and bicycling to school. So in summary, we know active students, better health, better behavior, better learning. We know active transportation generally yields great benefits to our communities, both from a chronic and infectious disease standpoint, could ease congestion, improve air quality. They even We know more walkable communities tend to be more economically resilient and more livable. Um, but we can't simply encourage. You need that multiple approach with the programmatic stuff, the policy stuff, the physical infrastructure stuff. So change the infrastructure. Don't just tell people to go walk on bike. And possible steps, concrete steps you could take would be get an interdisciplinary work group together, go out and hold a walk audit, engage with the community partners, do some evaluation, figure out where people are coming from, why, what would take to shift modes, identify routes to school, use some of these low cost methods. Definitely identify these satellite locations. I can't say strongly enough how promising that approach has been in the communities where I've been lucky enough to work. You know, satellite drop off and pick up locations. Organize walking school buses from those locations, from neighborhoods, bicycle trains, and then continue to engage and evaluate, see what's working, see what you need more of. Um, I, I promise you, you can shift the numbers here uh, by applying this approach. And you must, because back in 2005, it was conjectured by the New England Journal of Medicine, a great article that said, we may be raising the first generation of kids with shorter than, uh, shorter life expectancies than their parents. These are my kids who are now both graduates of, of college. So you can tell this is like 15 years or so ago. And just last year, a journal article was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association that said it's happened. Basically, these kids will be looking at shorter statistical life expectancies than their parents. From a statistical standpoint, that shift has occurred with this generation. We can do better and we must, and now is the time uh, because we've got an awful lot of very contemporaneous incentives. Okay, that's an awful lot of Fenton, so I apologize if I went long, but um, I, I hope I gave you some concrete actionable stuff here. I'm gonna take a breath and uh, turn it back over. Ooh, thanks so much, Mark, that was that was awesome. Um, you know, as, as you suggested, helping students walk and bike to school, it's always been critical from a health perspective. 
And uh, COVID-19 has really only made it more critical. You know, schools and families are potentially facing some serious transportation challenges, uh, given those reductions in bus capacity, you know, added complexity in carpooling, et cetera. And um, walking and biking has a real role to play in alleviating those challenges. Um, I love that you highlighted a lot of the, you know, some simple strategies um, that can be coordinated between schools and community partners. Um, but there are certainly times that I think when communities need an outside helping hand, um, and there's quite a bit of that help available in Vermont. So I want to introduce John Kaplan, who is the Bike Pedestrian Program Manager at VTrans. Um, and he's one of those helping hands and can tell you a little more about some of the resources available for this work at the state level. So uh, go ahead, John, if you're able to unmute yourself. All right, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, great. Mark, good to see you again. <laughs> and uh, thanks, Jonathan, for um, giving me just a couple minutes. Um, so great presentation by Mark, as usual. Um, and like he said, we've we go back for I don't know. <laughs> we can literally say decades now, right? <laughs> oh my gosh, we're um, getting old. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Um, I guess a couple of the main resources I want to point out that VTrans has uh, available for communities. One, probably the one that is most um, relevant is our, we have a grant program. Um, so that is the bicycle and pedestrian grant program that I oversee. Um, actually the solicitation um, is open right now for projects, for new projects. Um, it's act was delayed this year because of COVID and other priorities that the legislature had, but we did get the go ahead to do our solicitation, albeit a few months uh, later than normal. Um, so, you know, um, two of the types of projects that we fund are, um, or I guess kind of sort of two um, categories. One is what we call a scoping study, which is when a community is looking at kind of a bigger infrastructure project or trying to figure out what their bike or pedestrian network um, needs to be. Um, and so it's essentially some planning funds to help flesh out the details of a project, find out what the construction cost might be and be able to take the next steps to implement that. Um, and then we also do fund the design and construction of projects. Um, Normally we have a third category for um, smaller scale projects and that was funded with just state funds. The other two that I mentioned are uh, federally funded um, because again, because of COVID our um, state funds this year are a little bit in question. So right now we are not soliciting for the smaller scale projects. Um, that's a relatively new program. It's been very popular since it started uh, probably five years ago. Um, and um, so we are hoping that the state funded uh, small scale program that we will be able to solicit for those in the future. But for now, we just have our um, uh, federal aid program open. Um, so that's kind of on the grant side. Um, those all the information about our grant program, I think hopefully Jonathan will have in the resource list, a link to the bike head page our web page. And then from there, you can get to all the application materials. Um, a presentation I did about the sort of uh, details of the grant program and all of that. Um, another thing that we've um, been trying to offer, and um, this has been in collaboration with Local Motion and others, um, is just technical assistance. So, for example, um, Jonathan and I are working with um, the town of Greensboro right now to look at sort of the heart of their. Um, sort of uh, downtown, if you will, downtown Greensboro, um, to try to make some, get them to envision some improvements to make walking safer. Um, so that kind of technical assistance, you know, that's always on the table as far as uh, the bike and ped program goes. So if you have projects that you're interested in, but maybe need a little bit of um, help in figuring out some of the details, um, you know, I'm not going to come out and do a whole like survey or whatever, but certainly can help sketch out some ideas. And then I know Local Motion, for example, has um, a trailer full of materials to help do like demonstration projects. And I'm glad, Mark, you included demonstration projects in your slides. I think that is a real um, 
I'm really happy that we've gone that direction more and more in the last few years because it's a chance for communities to try out some of these things at fairly low risk, low cost, show that they can be a success, make adjustments to the design kind of on the fly. You know, if you do something with cones and a vehicle takes the corner and knocks over a few cones, then you know, you got to make some adjustments and then you you haven't invested a lot. You haven't poured any concrete yet. So um, that's a, a great way to test out some of these ideas. Um, we do have some safety resources, um, just more in terms of like, you know, hard copy resources, like we have a share the road brochure um, and a bicycle commuters guide. Uh, we helped Local Motion reprint a parent's guide to safe bicycling, and actually, Local Motion helps us get all of those materials out into the hands of folks who want them. So we appreciate that uh, partnership. Um, and you know, kind of along the lines of technical assistance um, and the walk audit that Mark mentioned, we have done um, pedestrian safety assessments in a couple of communities. Um, did one in the city of Rutland a few years ago that was pretty successful and they actually did end up making or uh, implementing some of the changes that came out of that assessment um, was right on a main street by the transit center close to the downtown and um, so um, and I just real quickly on the demonstration project side I will mention that VTrans is uh, close to finalizing kind of a um, uh, policy, if you will, document about demonstration projects on the state system. So we've been getting requests for those and we really didn't have a way to, um, you know, give communities guidance on what we would, what would be acceptable on the state system. But that guide is uh, almost complete and should be out this fall. Um, I'll just, I, uh, Mark had a bunch of great resources. Really everything from NACTO is, is good in terms of their guidance. They have a really new, good new guide about setting speed limits. Um, it's kind of a subtle thing, but um, sort of the traditional way that speed limits get set. Um, I won't go into the details of that, but NACTO has kind of an alternate approach to setting speed limits that is more kind of community sensitive. Um, and I think a lot of cities are, are looking at that now. So that that's a, you know, I know we're short on time, so that's kind of a quick summary and, and people should definitely feel free to reach out to me and glad to help in any way we can. Excellent, thank you, John. And uh, yeah, John's contact information as well as uh, all the resources he mentioned are gonna be in the packet that you receive um, either later today or tomorrow. Um, there was a little bit of a concern that this webinar might cut off at three, but I think looks like we're okay for now. So if folks need to leave, we certainly understand that, but if you can stay, um, I want to talk about just a couple of the resources at Local Motion that are available, and then we can also take some questions. Um, and there's going to be a sign-up sheet uh, that you'll get. So if you have any other questions, you can certainly ask through that, and we'll respond to you. Um, so in addition to John Kaplan, Local Motion is also available as a resource for this work. Um, many of you already know Mary Catherine Graziano. Um, she's behind our education and safety program. Uh, Mary Catherine, do you want to talk a little bit about your work and uh, the support you can offer to school communities? Absolutely. So I am the education and safety manager at Locomotion. I mostly manage our youth and general education programming, which includes Bike Smart, Walk Smart, uh, this uh, education and encouragement component of Safe Routes to School. So we have a broad suite of resources we can provide to you from signage to an actual program um, like a bike smart program our trailers full of bikes we'll bring them to your school bring them to your school. Uh, educate kids on their bike handling skills and how to walk safely on our streets and um, I just um, with a, the help of a lot of people created a document on how to run a walk-in school bus, a bike train, and a remote drop-off during COVID to help um, use those modes to make things more efficient at when kids get to school. So for example, 
you could have the walking school bus leader take temperatures as they pick kids up from school, which um, will actually save the parents a lot of time because it'll give them an opportunity to plan a little bit more before the start of the school day if it turns out their child is sick and has to stay home. So um, well, that resource will be in our packet that we are sending out. And if you have any questions for me about um, any of the resources I offer, I'm happy to uh, share them with you. My email will be on that packet we sent out. Thanks, Mary Catherine. Um, Finally, yeah, I'm, I'm also available to assist schools through the school travel planning process. Uh, local motions role in school travel planning is really as a facilitator. So that means that we can make connections between community partners like regional planning commissions, you know, existing bike walk councils, other nonprofits, um, and just generally help you get this work done, get you through the process. Um, we may occasionally actually assist with uh, walk auditing and, and creating the school travel plans. Um, and we also have a trailer, as uh, Mark and John mentioned, that is full of temporary demonstration materials like paint, bollards, signage. Um, and the, the, this is all equipment that communities can use to test out uh, new infrastructure. Um, so with that, um, I think we have some questions. Mary Catherine, do you want to bring any of those questions up? There, I do not see any new questions. Um, we have, um, we had somebody ask a little while ago um, about how do we get kids to walk to Burlington High School and how do we get kids to walk and bike in towns when some kids live way out from their schools, for example, in Essex. That was from Jill Allen. Yeah, uh, Mark, do you want to talk? I mean, you probably don't know Burlington well enough to talk about BHS specifically. I can chime in on that. But do you want to talk a little more about um, solutions for more rural communities where the school is farther away from where folks live? Yeah, I, I, I think the simple answer on that, I hope I got at that over the course of the, the presentation, was to not have any delusions that you're going to get people to kids to ride a bike, you know, 15 miles to and from school daily or anything, but that um, I, I think there's been some interesting work. I'm going to reiterate that work around bus routing because often kids who are coming from those distances, if they're being driven rather than taking the bus or if parents are not comfortable, you know, sort of, then, then there, there are two things. One, if the bus is a viable option, if there are low enough um, uh, riderships on the bus that a parent feels comfortable having their student on a bus, having the bus routes shortened by not stopping in every driveway, in other words, by increasing the efficiency of routes with area uh, area stops or nodes, they sometimes call them, can help, right? Shorten bus routes. But that may not be viable. I mean, there are going to be a certain number of parents, and there are going to be literally limitations on how many can ride on buses. Um, and and you know, my answer there, I think the strongest tool that I see in the toolkit is this idea of these remote or satellite drop off and pick up locations, and and that really requires getting out in the community around the school saying okay is there a church with an empty parking lot is there a park you know is there you know that has parking that that tends not to be busy during the day it tends to be more evening and weekend based um, we've seen a movie theater used because movie theaters tend to have afternoon evening and weekend shows but weekdays in the morning and afternoon of school arrival and dismissal times parking lots empty so a movie theater a movie theater parking lot was used as a remote drop off and pickup location for a school. Um, so being creative and looking at that, and remember the idea there is we're easing the traffic congestion at the school and the kids that are coming at least a little distance are still getting some physical activity, right? I'm still getting out of the car and walking that last half mile, third of a mile, whatever it is, uh, to school. Um, and so they're gaining some of those benefits, the health benefits, the alertness, all of the, that goes with that. Uh, I think that that's kind of my, my simple answer. Uh, the last thing I will say is I, I'm amazed at in more rural environments, how um, successful communities are at pursuing trails. In other words, that those tend to be settings where utility corridors, rail corridors, some of those have not all been subsumed and may still be available. That tends to be the longer view though, right? A trail is a multi-year project. Um, although when we go on the walk audits, I'm astonished at the number of times I've had kids show me the informal pathways they're already using on those kinds of corridors. There's already a warm path there. They say, oh yeah, we ride our mountain bikes this way to school all the time. Um, and then it begs the question, could we do anything to formalize that? Could we clean it up a little bit? Could we hit, help in spots where there's a lot of erosion so that it could be used more of the year? 
could we clear it in the winter? Could uh, could a partnership of of uh, local advocates say, you know, we're gonna or we're gonna run snow machines on it and compact it so that kids could walk on it or or cross country ski on it? Um, and although you might think that's a goofy idea, in Houghton, Michigan, which is one of the communities I showed a picture of, if you remember, uh, they use some of their ski trails as uh, ski to ski to school routes because this is Upper Peninsula, Michigan. They get a lot of snow in the winter or have historically, and and so. I guess the world is your oyster. You are only limited by how creative and open-minded you are about this. Hope that doesn't sound like a dodge. <laughs> no, I think that was good. And um, specifically, specifically with BHS, you know, the the infrastructure for kids to walk there is really yeah. uh, pretty solid. Um, right. But it's but it's a long walk. It's for a lot of kids. You know, if you're in the south end um, or even the far new north end. Um, you know, we're talking specifically about Burlington here. It's a long walk, so I think um, one really good solution there is to improve the bike infrastructure, um, so that the trip isn't so long. Kids can hop on a bike, and and they're there in a much shorter period of time than they would be walking. And so, um, local motion is actually working to advocate to improve the infrastructure to BHS this year. Um, we have protected bike lanes um, through the new north end that are going to stay in place at least through the end of October. Right. Um, so we're we are working on that actively. Um, Mary Catherine, any other questions? Yes, actually, we have something from Mary Yates. Um, and um, I think this one is for John Kaplan. Mary, can you, um, uh, are you able to speak on this or should I just read yours out loud? Okay. Mary, um, you should be unmuted if you want to try it in. Okay. Yeah, I was just, you know, wondering if school, you know, we already know that, you know, buses, they're, you know, limiting the number of students that are going to be arriving by bus. And Bristol Elementary School already has a high percentage of children arriving by bus. And so, you know, presumably they're just going to have people arrive, you know, by car. And I'm just wondering if schools as a whole are getting any guidance from the state or, you know, from VTrans to how to deal with that increase of the number of cars, you know, for bringing kids to school. Like, or is it really going to be on the people like myself who attempt to run safe routes to school programs at the elementary schools? Uh, um, well, I I don't know of any guidance that uh, that VTrans is is looking at around that issue. Um, yeah, I mean that's a really good point. Um, I think you know certainly having that safer to school program already in place um, is helpful because you know you have some of the tools, you know kind of where some of the places are that um, you know people or kids and in Bristol can walk or, or bike to school. Um, and I know, you know, I'm somewhat familiar with Bristol, so I know you have a pretty good sidewalk network around the school. So um, I think just the fact that you've identified that as a potential issue um, and maybe bring that up with the school and, and seeing how they could work with you on that. Yeah, yeah I, you know, I, I know that Mary Catherine has a survey out to all of us say across the school people, um, which I haven't actually completed yet, but I'm just wondering if, you know, it just, you know, I hate to burden, you know, my principal, you know, with my say across the school, you know, agenda, so to speak, even though I think, I personally think it's very important, but I know that there is a lot on their plates right now. And, you know, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to, you know, give my already, you know, good status, like, a bad, you know, bad rap by, like, continuing to try to promote my, our, you know, take about the school agendas with people who are tapped out or potentially tapped out. I don't really know if they're tapped out, but I'm sort of assuming they are, you know, there's a lot going on. <laughs> 
So I mean, I'm happy to advocate, you know, for continuing, you know, maybe a satellite drop off is the solution. It seems great. Um, I, you know, I have spoken to my principal about that in the past, but it doesn't really get any traction. Um, anyway, just just throwing it out there. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, it is really important to acknowledge that um, school resources are really stressed right now. Town resources are really stressed right now. Um, there are a couple things that I would say, and one is um, it's really important to try to get a sense of, you know, the scope of the problem if you can. So I think um, if you can send out some kind of parent transportation survey um, to understand what the needs are and how many folks in the community are um, really sort of being left in the lurch by the reduced bus capacity, that can help um, bring that sense of urgency to the school in that they'll actually understand that there's a real problem here that needs to be solved. Um, and if you find that there isn't a real problem here that needs to be solved, then maybe it's not the right time to push it in your community if the resources are really stressed. Um, so I think it's a time when we all have to be real, really realistic and pragmatic about this stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Mary Catherine, any other uh, questions you want to bring up? And if folks need to leave, I mean, folks are dropping off, so if you need to leave, um, please don't, uh, please go ahead and do so, and we'll keep taking questions. Yeah, I don't see any questions right now um, that have been typed recently. There's some people asking if we're going to get slides or if we're going to get the presentation or the various materials, which we tried to answer, but it's worth saying, I suppose. Okay, sounds good. Well, in that case, um, we will wrap it up. Um, as I mentioned, later today or early tomorrow, you'll get a link. Um, you'll get an email that's going to have a link to the recording of this webinar. It's going to have that resource packet we've mentioned a few times that'll have contact information for um, myself, Mary Catherine, and John Kaplan. Um, and um, we really look forward to helping you and um, hearing from you. And thanks so much for joining us today. And we wish everyone. Uh, safe and a uh, good weekend. All right. Talk to you later. Thanks, you guys. Pleasure to be with you. Thank Thanks, you, Mark. Jonathan.